shine on the light. We all over the world, China and Africa. We all over the world, China and Africa. Welcome to China, we bring you good vibes. We shine on the light. Welcome to China, we bring you good vibes. We shine on the light. We all over the world, China and Africa. Chat Night Africa, let's gang up, change mindset, and empower Africans. Are you ready? Africa to the world! And now, live from the headquarters of Chat Night Africa, Divine Shamika. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of the broadcast. It used to be described as Africa's oasis of peace. Today, it is now a theater of war. What's happening in Anglophone Cameroon? Since 2017, many people in the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon took up arms against the central government in Yaoundé to fight for an independent state called Ambazonia. Anglophone Cameroonians, I must say, are split about the war, even if they all along have complained about being marginalized. There are those who want an outright breakup from the Yaoundé government. Others want a federated configuration. And there are those who want the current unitary structure, but with the two regions having a greater say in how they are governed. War have dire consequences, whether in Europe, the Middle East, or in Africa. In times of war, there is propaganda, each side spinning the reasons for the fight or what actually is going on in the affected areas. On Voices of Africa Today, we attempt to separate facts from fiction. Let me be clear that we sent an invitation to the Communications Secretariat of Ambazonia, and until now, got no word back. Dr. Simon Munzo accepted to come take our questions, but also your questions. Dr. Munzo holds a PhD in law from Cambridge University in England. He also held several senior level positions at the United Nations and for many, many years. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming Dr. Munzo on the, on the, on, on the platform. Dr. Munzo will be taking your questions momentarily. Dr. Munzo, welcome to Voices of Africa. We're glad to have you on this week, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Dr. Munzo, you have been heard describing the war for independence as an illusion. What are you opposed to, independence or the method to achieve it? Well, first of all, I want to thank you again for having me on the platform. Um, I've made the point of accepting invitations to appear and interact uh, with uh, all the various platforms that have invited me, because I believe that it's important that uh, we all uh, talk, uh, dialogue uh, uh, from various angles with respect to the conflict in our country. Um, well, you ask me, what am I against? Is it independence or the method? 
uh, perhaps I should say that I'm against both. Against independence, not that I wouldn't have preferred in 1959 or 1960 that the Southern Cameroons should have been given uh, the opportunity of acceding to statehood as a standalone independent country. That would have been my, my, my preference if I had a, a voice in 1959, 1960, or 1961. But at that time, I was only uh, 11 years old, 12 years old, depending upon whether you take it from 1960 or 1961. So our territory, British Southern Cameroons, was deprived of the opportunity of acceding to independence standing on its own by the international community, which restricted our people to acceding to independence by joining Nigeria or joining Republic of Cameroon. But once we get past that, what we have is that effective the 1st of October 1961, when the trusteeship agreement between the United Nations and the United Kingdom over the territory of the Southern Cameroons ended because on that same day, we acceded to independence by joining Republic of Cameroon further to a choice made by our own people in the plebiscite of 11 February 1961, from that day on, the question of our independence was resolved. Okay? We acceded to independence by joining Republic of Cameroon. So, to come to 2016, 2017, 2018, and start talking again about our independence doesn't make sense. That is why I believe that, I mean, if you ask me the question, therefore, whether I would be for independence, I say it's not, independence is not on the cards right now. That's, it's not an issue anymore. And let's stop fooling ourselves that it, it is. It's not. So that's for independence. Now, Dr. Comes, Munzo, uh, yeah. Dr. Munzo, why do you think you are right and others wrong? Now, when people, others have argued that when you get into a marriage and the marriage is not working, you should have the right to leave. Why are these people okay. with these arguments wrong? All right. I mean, if we, if we, if we take that analogy of, of marriage uh, uh, divine, then you have to distinguish between uh, divorce and, uh, if you like, uh, your, your status as a spinster. You understand? Before you got married, you were living your own life as, well, take it from uh, the, the, the lady's point of view, as a spinster, the, the young man was living his own life I don't know what uh, the equivalent of spinster in, for a man is. Okay? Now, then you got married. And if the marriage doesn't work, if you are arguing that you want to divorce, all right. <laughs> By all means, file, file for divorce. But don't say that, don't act as if a marriage never took place. You understand? And in the course of negotiating the divorce, the parties would agree on what basis the, the, the divorce. They might even have people intervening from the family, from friends, and all of that saying, you guys uh, don't go too far. You don't need to go as far as a divorce. You can patch up this marriage, try to make it work. So using your analogy of marriage, <laughs> that we, we, that, that's, that's where we are. We cannot deny that there was a wedding. We cannot decide that there was a marriage just because the, mar the, 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 the marriage has broken down. You, you talk it about has, it has broken down. It doesn't automatically lead to divorce. You, you, so you, you talk about the plebiscite of 1961, sir. There are people, those who oppose you say it was in their words, quote, and in French, a braquage. You understand what 
I, I mean, uh, what a brakash is. What, like a, a hold, a hold up? Uh, like a hold up of yeah. you know those who when they were forced to do it. No, I mean of course not. Again, I mean that's uh, we're talking about propaganda and myths. Look, what, what I would have liked to hear what makes them say that. Let's not forget, and I keep uh, reminding us Cameroonians about this if we want to, 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 ta to tackle this problem uh, from the point of view of fact and history. What was Cameroon? What were the British Cameroons? I was going to ask you how exactly. we came to being called exactly. Republic of Cameroon. Please walk, uh, off the, walk us down that path. Uh, okay. To, to, to get there, my, my, my dear uh, brother divine, we have to acknowledge the fact that Cameroon as a country is a fabrication of colonialism. Period. We had our fundums. You are from Bali, as far as I know. You, you have, you have your, your Bali is an ethnic nation. Uh, Mankon is an ethnic nation. You go, Bamun is an ethnic nation. If you like, Bakweri is an ethnic nation. Mbo, my own ethnic group, which by the way, have part of us in Francophone Cameroon and part of us in Anglophone Cameroon. The Mbo, we are an ethnic nation. Now, what happened, 19, uh, 1884, colonialists sit down in, in, in Berlin, and they bring a number of these ethnic nations together and say, Germany, here is your share. OK? And Germany decides to call that its share Cameroon. Borrowing, of course, from the Portuguese Camaroes. You know, you know the story, OK? But just to, just to, 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 the, 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 to give the background, so it is colonialists who created a conglomeration of ethnic nations and gave it the name Cameroon. Now, when Germany took that part as its own, if we had all continued to be, uh, to be colonized by Germany right to the, right to the, to the period of decolonization, we wouldn't have any problem between Anglophone and Francophone because there would be no Anglophone and Francophone. But again, as you know, uh, Germany loses the First World War. The victorious, the victorious Allied powers decide to share Germany's possessions among themselves. As you are aware, Tanganyika was taken entirely by Great Britain. Uh, uh, Southwest Africa, now called Namibia, was taken from Germany entirely by and given to Great Britain and subsequently South Africa, as you know. Uh, Rwanda and Burundi, uh, Rwanda, Urundi, as they were called, were, were, were given to, to both of them to Belgium. Cameroon could have been given entirely to France or entirely to the United Kingdom or any other of the Allied powers. But again, the colonialists among themselves decided that they would divide the country into two, give one little part to, to the United Kingdom and the larger part to France. That was not to do with, Cam that was not a decision of Cameroonians. It was not you or me or, or our forebears. That is where we have all of a sudden the dichotomy, Anglophone, Francophone. Now come, uh, and all of that under the auspices of the League of Nations, okay? So technically, we're not a colony of Great Britain. We're not a colony of France. We were a, 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 a territory that had been taken from Germany. And the League of Nations said, UK, France, administer these territories on, as, as a mandate from us, okay? Fast forward to 1945. Again, Germany loses the Second World War cannot recover its, its previous territories. Uh, the arrangement under the League of Nations is confirmed by the United Nations. And with the difference technically that we are no longer mandated territories, we become trust territories of the United Nations, but still administered by those two powers. Okay? So that's, that's, the, that's, that's the predicament where we are. Now, when it comes then to decolonization as Africa in the late 50s, the African uh, 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 elite intelligentsia begin to, uh, to demand uh, independence. Now, in the case of Cameroon, it is young Cameroonians, <laughs> the intelligentsia of the time, 
on both sides who say, we have a desire to reconstitute our country as it was under the Germans. Okay? That's why you will find that our, our, uh, our students in universities, they are not mangoes, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the the monikosos, uh, to, just to take the anglophone side, were pro the Cameroon idea. Bring the two back together. On the other side, you had uh, uh, students who were angling for the same thing. So the Cameroon idea, meaning reconstitute German Cameroon, did not come from the colonialists. It's Cameroonians who wished for it. And if you like, the germs, the seeds of reunification were sown then. And when it came to political activity, the UPC, as the main uh, nationalist party in uh, Francophone Cameroon, its platform was, we want reunification. And it, has its, it had its echoes in Anglophone Cameroon as well. So again, let's not again talk about myth. Let's not act as if it is someone who imposed the Cameroon idea, as the young people at the time called it, upon our people. Now, let, let's fast forward to the plebiscite of 1961. How People have been asking the question, how do you say achieve independence by joining? If yeah. you achieve independence by joining, where's your independence there? Well, again... As, as an international lawyer, sir. Exactly. Let me, let me make clear, as I said earlier, uh, Divine that if, I mean, there was no reason why we as a territory, whether in terms of our size, our population, our economic resources, and so on, we were arguably, demonstrably, much more viable than a number of countries in the Caribbean, in Africa itself, and elsewhere, which got independence standing on their own, when, when in fact, they were much worse off than us, as I say, on the criteria of size and population and so on. Therefore, I, 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 I see, I assert, I don't, I don't just concede, I assert that it was a great injustice done to us by the international community not to allow us the possibility of getting independence on our own. Okay. But once they had chosen to do that, the next thing was, uh, they uh, limited up to the option of independence by joining. Now, of course, literally speaking, you would say, how can we be independent by joining? But that, let's not forget that for the same international community, and this is important, uh, people have cited but misrepresented General Assembly Resolution 1541-1541 of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Now, that is a resolution that was, uh, that contained a, a declaration laying down conditions, a number of principles which placed colonizing powers under an obligation to report to the United Nations on the, 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 the governing of their territories. Now, the important thing in that, from the point of view of what we are discussing, is that this resolution stated that a non-self-governing territory, and that's how they called it, non-self-governing territory, to be considered as fully self-governing, those are the terms, to be considered as fully self-governing, could achieve that status of full self-government under one of three modalities. I'm not inventing this. I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you whether what you are saying is your interpretation of it or no, 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 facts it's, as they are. It's not, it's not my interpretation, it's the facts as they are. In fact, if you, if, if you want, I can read the text uh, to you. Uh, I have resolution 1541. That, that's okay. In, in uh, other words, I, I can read the principles to you. Okay. A principle number, uh, principle number six, if I can. Th that's okay. In anyway, way, you, but you, just, you, just you are to, saying just, that. Just to tell you then, just to tell you, and your uh, uh, people are listening to me, your show is recorded and all of that. Anybody can go and verify after this. 
Okay. Now, the 1541 said that there are three modalities by which a non self governing territory achieves full self governance. Full. Number one, by becoming independent as, as, a, as, a, as a standalone independent state. What we would have preferred. Okay. Right. But then they also said, by associating with an independent state. Okay? And the third modality was by integration, and that's the word that is used, by integration into an independent state. Under any one of those three modalities, as per General Assembly Resolution 1541, a non-self-governing territory was considered as having achieved, attained full self-governance. Now, when it came to the third option, integrating an independent state, there were conditions laid down as to what that integration should do, the process to follow. And I can tell you that much as we, especially looking back, can complain that we were not put under modality number uh, modality A rather than C. But once we were given C, everything went from there. And our people were consulted. And that's where the plebiscite of 11 February 1961 comes in. Because by the way, by the yes. way, the resolution the resolution we're talking about, by the way, that resolution is of uh, December 1960. It was adopted in, I think, 15th December 1960, ahead of the plebiscite of 11 February 1961. Would okay. you say, therefore, because this is where I think the bone of con contention is, Dr. Munzo, mm -hmm. would you say, therefore, that Southern Cameroonians, in being presented the question by the United Nations the way it was, were cheated, were given the short end of the stick? Given the short end of the stick, yes. And I say that because, as I, say, as I, I repeat, if, if I would have preferred that we get our own outright independence. So from that point of view, they were given the short end of the stick. But let's not forget that in that process, they were induced into that. All right, let me put it, they, they partly induced the international community to do that for them, as it were. Because the, 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 the Cameroon idea, as I was saying, Cameroon spelled with the, the German formula, K-A-M-E-R-U-N, the Cameroon idea was originated by Cameroonians. And so, of course, for the United Kingdom, which, remember, had administered us as an integral part of Nigeria, and they make no bones about that, even though we technically our status was of a trust territory. And the protectorate of Nigeria and the colony of Lagos together were a British colony. Nevertheless, as you are aware, the British chose with the approval first of the League of Nations and subsequently of the United Nations they got approval to administer our territory as an integral part of Nigeria. Okay, right, right, right up to 19, 1961. From, so basically from 1916, or 1922 to be more exact, uh, to, to, 19, to 1961. Yeah, so um, that shouldn't, uh, 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 and therefore what I'm saying is that the idea of Living, giving us a choice between joining independence by joining Nigeria or independence by joining Cameroon was contributed to partly by our own elite who at the time were pushing the idea of rebuilding Cameroon. Okay. So when we, two quick questions here to cross-examine what you've just said, sir. Mm -hmm. The plebiscite, you acknowledge that if you were there, you would prefer it otherwise, independent by standing alone. That's what I just got from you. Yeah, but that has nothing to do with the plebiscite. The, 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 the plebiscite was, given, given the fact that 
you Cameroonians, not only the elite uh, starting from the 1940s, as I'm talking about, but specifically, remember that in, 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 the, in southern Cameroons, when the KNDP was formed by Foncha and Jua, later on joined by Muna and others, in 1955, breaking away from the the the, the uh, from Endelis KNC the, the the element element number one on the campaign platform of the KNDP was independence and unification reunification with French Cameroon okay now uh, Endelis KNC, the Cameroon National Congress, which later on when it was joined with Mbile's KPP, Cameroon People's Party, became the CPNC, Cameroon People's National Congress. Uh, NDNA's party, in terms of their own platform, was in favor of us joining Nigeria. So you see, this whole thing about joining one or joining the other was promoted not only by our own intelligentsia, as I said earlier, university students and all of that, but by the first, our own pioneer political parties on our territory after they broke away from the, the NCNC. Question, Dr. Mun, uh, Munzo. Yes. Mm -hmm. When the vote was taken to, to be independent by joining Cameroon, Republic of Cameroon, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. what was that union going to look like? What was that union going to look like? The uh, parties, even before, remember that even before the plebiscite, there were those there were those two options between our in front of our people, and there was a campaign in favor of one or the other, led as I as I told you earlier by the the KNC with respect to joining Nigeria, KNDP, and subsequently. Okay, in the two matters, one Cameroon with respect to joining the Republic of Cameroon. And well before the 11th of February 1961, those two camps campaigned vigorously amongst our population, telling them what would happen if we joined Nigeria on the one part and Republic of Cameroon on the other. In fact, the document which was used, which they both, the both camps used for their campaign, was a document produced by the United Nations called the Two Alternatives. That, that document is in the archives. Anybody can go and look it up. Now, the United Nations is the organization that produced that document. But it produced the document, taking into account the fact that there was this there were just two currents on the territory and that these two currents were going to have to campaign among the population and to facilitate their doing so the un produced one document on the basis of which they led their campaign the, the two alternatives now in that document the and then side or reflecting the end side it was laid down very clearly what would happen if we join nigeria based on undertakings that Nigeria had given uh, to Endeli prior to the plebiscite. Similarly, there had been negotiations before February 11th, 1961. There were negotiations between Foncha, the, the UPC, even though the UPC had in fact been banned, but it was living in clandestinely, including inside our own territory, southern Cameroons, as we all know, but more, more specifically, between Foncha and the ruling party in the Francophone side, Ahijo's party. Again, the parties agreed as to what would happen should the plebiscite result go in favor of our territory joining the Republic of Cameroon. They had those discussions before the 11th of February. And when finally the, uh, the verdict went in favor of our joining Republic of Cameroon, the, 
General Assembly of the United Nations meeting on the 21st of April, 1961, so let us say about three months after the plebiscite, examined the reports of the plebiscite commissioner, examined the reports of the trusteeship council relating to that plebiscite, and came to the conclusion uh, which we find in the frequently quoted United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1608, 1608. Right. And again, anybody can go and read that. It's five short uh, paragraphs. The General Assembly uh, approved the results of the plebiscite thanked the, uh, the, the, the UN Plebiscite Commissioner and his staff. And then with respect to Northern Cameroons, because the evidence before them on that 21st of April was that Nigeria and, had, and, and uh, the United Kingdom had finalized their understanding as to what would happen with the territory of Northern Cameroons if the vote to join Nigeria as they eventually did, which was namely that Northern Nigeria will become a separate province within the Northern region of Nigeria. That was what was agreed. And because of that, the UN General Assembly stated in that 1608, that since everything is clear concerning Nigeria, uh, Northern Cameroons, from the 1st of June, 1961, the trusteeship agreement between the United Kingdom and the United Nations over the territory of Northern Cameroons will end because on that day, that territory will become the Sadauna, what well, they subsequently called it, they named it Sadauna province in the Northern region of Nigeria. And that was the end of that. That's where they are here today. Okay. But when it came to Southern Cameroons, the evidence before the same General Assembly on that same day was that the negotiations between the parties, namely the United Kingdom as a ministerial authority, uh, the, uh, United, uh, the Republic of Cameroon and Southern Cameroons had not yet been finalized. There been a series of discussions, but they had not been finalized. And so you will find in Resolution 1608, the General Assembly asking those three parties to initiate discussions with a view to finalizing arrangements. I'm virtually quoting, and I have the text here. I can quote. I can read it out to you. And anybody can read it, correct? Exactly. Anybody can read it. Okay. 1608 to finalize the arrangements by which the intentions of the party will be, will be given effect. So this is 21st of April, uh, 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 1961. But then uh, the General Assembly added that they have to do everything to make sure that those uh, discussions which they are going to engage conclude no, no later than 1st of October 1961, the day on which the trusteeship agreement between the, U the UN and the UK over Southern Cameroons would end. This is the wording of the, resol of the resolution. Okay? And it is, it is after that that the parties held a first meeting in Buea in May of 1961. Then our own people just the Southern Cameroons on its own, the government and opposition parties held another meeting in Bamenda following the meeting in Buya. Then the parties, this time Republic of Cameroon and Southern Cameroons met in Fumban to continue discussions and negotiations. And after Fumban, again, the Republic of Cameroon and Southern Cameroons met in Yawunde in August of 1961. So he had a series of meetings, and it is that series of meetings and the things that were discussed that culminated in the drafting and eventual adoption of 
what came became known as the federal constitution of first october 1961 because again under that arrangement the parties following all these various negotiations that they are having all along had come to the agreement that the the new country emerging from the coming together of the two cameroons would be called the federal republic of cameroon i have a question here sir yes when the new country was now to be called the federal republic of cameroon mm -hmm. did the international community the united nations did they or the british mm -hmm. did they maintain or had they mapped out a boundary an international boundary for southern cameroons which was never ever to be relinquished or yes no listen the the boundary what we can call the boundaries of southern cameroons were, were, were traced by virtue of the need to trace the boundary between the part of the german colony of cameroon which was going to go to the united kingdom and the part which was going to go to France. So, of course, there was an international boundary between French Cameroon and British Cameroons. No doubt about that. Just as there was an international boundary between British Cameroons and Nigeria. Specifically, yes. when you had the two the British Cameroons, former British Cameroons, and then the French Cameroon, when they came together at the Fuman conference, were there some lines that were never ever supposed to be crossed by either side? Uh, how, how do I don't understand what you in mean? In other line. words, mm -hmm. could the French part of Cameroon just decide that okay, um, now it's federal, it was a federated structure, they mm -hmm. can just decide that okay, now it's Republic of Cameroon, okay, and that's fine. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> no. So, no? as a lawyer, is yes. that a violation of law? Because you are what, what is, arguing, you're asking me what is what is a violation of law? I that's the point. What? Uh, what? What? The fact that you moved mm -hmm. at the, 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 the Article One of the Federal Constitution of Fumban, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, it clearly mm -hmm. said that mm -hmm. the two parts were coming together as equal partners. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you get this mutation from federal republic of cameroon mm -hmm. to united the republic of cameroon mm -hmm. and then to unite uh, to republic Repub of cameroon yes the question i have to you uh, i have for you sir mm -hmm. is did anybody violate the law at that point oh okay that's a that, that's a that's a that's an, in, an intriguing one <laughs> uh divine and let's let's deal with it because again is one of the issues on which people have built a myth uh perhaps for lack of uh, rigorous analysis of the situation. Now, the Article One, Article One of uh, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Cameroon that came into force on the first of October, nineteen sixty-one, stipulated very clearly that, with effect from that date, the Federal Republic of Cameroon is born. Okay. To be made up of, constituted of, uh, the former Re Republic of Cameroon. In other words, the, the, the territory that became independent from France on the 1st of January 1960 and took the name Republic of Cameroon. Okay? So the Federal Republic of Cameroon was to be constituted by the former republic of cameroon henceforth to be known as the federated state of east cameroon you understand and the former british southern cameroons because they put it former cameroons under british administration henceforth to be known as the federated state of west cameroon okay so republic of cameroon becomes east cameroon southern cameroons becomes west cameroon and the two form the federal republic of cameroon okay now come 1972 
when Ahijo decides that the Federal Republic of Cameroon will henceforth be called the United Republic of Cameroon. Which territories do you think are involved there? It is West Cameroon and East Cameroon, right? I'm listening, yes. Yes, it's East, West Cameroon and East Cameroon, which together again have now taken the name United Republic of Cameroon. Question, was it just a name change or there were some fundamental differences in the way now res residents of West Cameroon, English part of Cameroon, where, where did their status change? No, no. You, you see, when, so when, what when, was Ahijo to gain by doing that if he wasn't changing something? Well, I mean, first, first, of course, you would have to, you have to ask him, but of course, uh, historians and scholars aren't uh, allowed to get try to get into the minds of, of people whose acts they are considering. So maybe I can go okay. into that exercise. Now, the, um, um, what, when you say, what, what did he have to gain? You, 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 you have to, we would have, maybe on a different occasion, because it is important, consider the circumstances in which French Cameroon obtained independence and in which Ahijo emerged as a president of Republic of Cameroon, even before the, even before reunification, okay. Now here was someone who came to power in the midst of a great, you know, uh, there was the, the the UPC rebellion raging, um, and he came, believing that his mission was to hold Cameroon together, collaborate with the French to beat off what they, what they considered to be uh, the UPC insurrection. They even called them terrorists and all of that. And his power was constantly threatened. Okay, he needed to consolidate his base. And he did that by a series of measures, including the fact that he did not actually allow the opposition to flourish in that part of the country and all of that. Then you find uh, Southern Cameroons coming to join them with our commitment to democracy, parliamentary government, and all of that. Now, just imagine what the injection of our system of governance meant for Ahijo in terms of embarrassing Ahijo as to how his own system was functioning. So, okay, but, uh, so, yes. so, yeah. so, so it wouldn't. It, it doesn't come, at least to me, it doesn't come as a surprise that, yeah, in, in Ahijo's mind, all of this was contingent. These people are bringing this, their parliamentary democracy, giving so much room to the opposition, liberty of the press, and all of that. This is not working for me. And so he, he did step by step, step by step, uh, try to kill that off with the connivance of some of our own people, which is regrettable, but he took he 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 dragged them along, you know. So if you ask me, what did he have to gain? What did he have to gain? The justification he gave was that uh, United Republic reinforces the idea of national unity. But it, well, it, I I really don't care what Ahijo was saying. My question to you, as a lawyer, sir, mm -hmm. is when they were moving from question before I even get there in the federal constitution. Mm -hmm. Was there any clause that under no circumstances that configuration was going to be was going to change? Well, I mean, the the, the, the oft cited uh, section forty seven of the Constitution. You must have heard about it. A lot of a lot of mention about it. I mean, I I I I, I, I myself, if I may say so, I was one of the first to flag. The uh, uh, the violation, as I saw it, of uh, Articles 47 or Section 47 of the Constitution, and I did that in uh, a TV interview in which I appeared on the program one of uh, your former colleagues used to run called Actualité Hebdo, and I, I was interviewed on that program on the 23rd of May 1993. 1993, that's about 28 years ago. If you, the, 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 
the recording of it is available on YouTube if anybody wants to check. So if I understand you, there was a but, violation of law there. No, exactly. What, what, what we argued then, because I was, I was SCNC spokesman at the time, what we argued then and we argued today was that the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the switch over from the Federal Republic of, of Cameroon to the United Republic of Cameroon, in other words, transforming the federation to a unitary state was unconstitutional. So be, because I have a question. because yes, it, so. was, it was a violation, we argued, it was a violation, we argued, of uh, Article 47 of the Constitution, which everybody is citing now. Thank you, sir, for um, acknowledging that violation. How did we get from United Republic of Cameroon to Republic of Cameroon? Now, when it, when it comes to that... Another the, violation? Yeah, uh, another, another violation, <laughs> if you like, another violation in terms of the change of name of the territory. Okay? In terms of the change of name of the territory, because there was no justification uh, for uh, for President Bia, if he decided, if he wanted also to take his turn in changing the name of the country, there was no justification for him to call it, uh, to call the entire country Republic of Cameroon. But then the okay? question, sir, is, yeah. Dr. Munzo, yeah. you are a Cambridge lawyer, you hold mm -hmm. a PhD in law from Cambridge, one of the best in the world. How is it that all this was going on and all of you, you plural, just laid back? One would think that you would file a lawsuit. No. Well, first of all, we're not, we're not laid back. <laughs> okay. We're not laid back. I mean, all what is going on now, some people will say, and some have said, <laughs> some of it in a, in a negative light, <laughs> as if to, to accuse us of something. Some have said that we are the ones who started, started all of this. Yeah. So it's not as if we were laid back. We were not. As I say, we had all these arguments, but the, the point was, in what forum do you put your argument? Now, we, weren't, we didn't have any uh, standing to take any action before the International Court of Justice, which would have been the best place to go, because as you know, uh, to be a party to a case before the International Court of Justice, you have to be a member state of the United Nations, which we were not. Okay, and we did try at the time, and when I say we, I mean the Southern Cameroon National Council, we did try at the time to see if we could, we could get a, a country, member state of the United Nations, who would understand our case and uh, act on our behalf to institute uh, an action before the International Court of Justice. We never succeeded. Here's a question it. from Jum Jinyo. He's writing from China. Mm -hmm. Professor Minz Munzo, given, the, the, given that the trusteeship of agreement, the trusteeship agreement ended as you say, Professor Munzo, what specific UN decision indicates that in an event of an unpleasant outcome of plebiscite, ple such arrangement cannot be revoked? No, what, what, I should, what, what I should ask rather is, can you show me which, what says that such an arrangement can be revoked? Because, I mean, the, for, for the United Nations, because, let's remember that this was not just a, a matter of an independent Southern Cameroons and an independent Republic of Cameroon is, is striking a deal. Uh, we would have wanted to go into the terms of the specific contract treaty or, that they signed uh, to see whether they allowed themselves any, they included any escape clause of any kind. Okay, but let's not uh, uh, lose sight of the fact that that is not what that that's not the, the those are not the auspices under which the Southern Cameroons and La République uh, came together. They came together in the context of a decolonization process. Well, but you saying uh, that? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait okay. a minute. And that decolonization process was conducted by the United Nations. And for the United Nations, effective the 1st of October 1961, Southern Cameroons had been decolonized, had achieved independence by joining the Republic of Cameroon. There was no room uh, for turning back on that. And that's why I keep telling uh, my compatriots that 
yeah, much as we have every reason to feel aggrieved that we're not allowed to stand on our own, our real grievance is that the basis on which we agreed to join these people, namely that we we're going to form a federation of two, two equal states, Correct. was breached. So that's our case. So what are you left with? Remember, the first question was, do you support or are you in opposition to the method of independence or independence itself? You said both. Well, you acknowledge that both we have reasons, Anglophone Cameroonians have reasons to feel aggrieved. So what is the recourse? Once again, let me repeat. What's once, the recourse? Once again, once again, let me repeat. Anglophone Cameroonians have reason to, to feel aggrieved with respect to the the events prior to 1st of October 1961, our grievance is that we should have been allowed to achieve independence on our own. You understand? Correct. So that's a grievance. But that grievance is overtaken by the fact that the United Nations, although what it did from our perspective was unjust, immoral, and all of that, it was not illegal because it fell in line with General Assembly Resolution 1541. Okay? Now, post 1st October 1961, we have a grievance. And our grievance that is that the basis on which we agreed to join the Republic has been breached. Because it's not as if we joined the Republic without anybody telling us what was going to happen when we joined. As I said, it was the object of a, a campaign, literature and campaign rallies, if educating our people. OK? So our people, we are, as of as today, entitled to, to say that the basis on which we joined, namely that we're going to constitute a federation, was breached in 1972. We have been complaining ever since then. All uh, very successive generations. So it's not as if we went to sleep. No, we, we've been constrained by uh, the, the, the reality of uh, international relations. But our people from the very beginning, whether acting individually through the pen and voices of the likes of Bernard von Long, or acting collectively like we try to do through the Anglophone General Conferences and subsequently the SCNC, or even what is happening now, we have a record of protest against what happened to us. Okay, so the, uh, uh, the so to so to wrap up on, on this one, I, I my, my position is that with respect to the decolonization grievance, there's not much we can do about that. So anybody who is telling you they can get the UN to reopen uh, our decolonization dossier as if uh, the UK will come back as a ministering authority and all of that, I can't consider that to be an illusion. It wouldn't happen. By contrast, by contrast, we would be entitled to push the case, to make the case even today, that there was a breach of the Constitution of 1961 in 1972, and that uh, we're entitled to repair that breach. Well, but you have been, all of you Anglophone, Cameroonian legal scholars have made their arguments, written petitions, protested, people have gone on the street, and what they meet is military confrontation. Yeah. Do you blame people who, when they feel that they, they have nowhere else to go, do you blame them for taking up arms? I don't, I don't blame anyone for taking up arms, and uh, uh, <laughs> that, that's why uh, uh, Divine, if you who are following these matters, including monitoring people on social media and all of that, I, I would like you to pull out one single example, one where whether in writing or in speech, I have condemned those whom I call separatists. Yes, I call them separatists. I'm not a separatist. I call them separatists. But whether I have condemned them for taking up arms, no. 
I don't condemn them for taking us because I can understand the frustration that we ourselves have felt by trying to use what we termed the force of argument. We said we prefer the force of argument to the argument of force. That was our mantra in the SCNC, at least in my time. Okay, but it's true that looking back, one can say that the force of argument was not given that much of a chance because of the attitude of Yawunde. And therefore, if uh, people come wanting to use the, uh, the um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, 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 the argument of force, I have never condemned them. However, I do say that number one, as you yourself indicated in your intro, you said war has dire consequences. War has dire consequences. And I spent the better part of my career at the United Nations, which spent nearly 25 years working in war-torn countries. So I know what the consequences of war are. And therefore, I have, with my knowledge of the what the possible consequences of war and being determined to spare our population of such consequences, I have argued in favor of us taking a negotiated approach to dealing with the issue of our domination, our marginalization, our, our, our assimilation, our, our, our takeover in violation of Article 47. Question, that's, Dr. That's where, that's where the difference. That's, a, that's where the difference is, and, and and that's taking into account many things. Unfortunately, there is so much. Uh, 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 in, uh, um, what should I say? Uh, lack of courtesy uh, on the other side, uh, you know, they will throw insult at you instead of dispassionately allowing us to engage a debate, even amongst ourselves, so that perhaps somebody who is misinformed, who is advocating a particular approach, thinking that it can work, whereas in fact there are all these other obstacles, can listen to po pointing out to someone that they have obstacles on their way it may not necessarily mean that you stop them on their journey, but they should embark on their, go on their journey knowing that they will meet obstacles on the way. Question, Dr. Munzo. You mm -hmm. constantly, and you've said it again and again on this show, that um, independence is an illusion. Thinking that you can achieve is an, an illusion. Why isn't it realistic? And here is the argument made. Eritrea got theirs from Ethiopia, Namibia from South Africa, South Sudan from mainland Sudan, and so on as well. Former republics of ex-Soviet Union restored, restored, restored their independence. Why do you think that Southern Cameroonians, their own quest for independence is unrealistic or unachievable? Well, you know, almost all those examples that you've cited, almost all those examples of territories that uh, broke away from uh, countries to which they once were belonged, were attached, or whatever, and who won their independence. Practi practically all of those are examples of ethnic nations. Ethnic nations. I in other words, whether you take Eritrea, whether you take the South Sudan you're calling with its con conglomeration of ethnic nations and so on, now those were ethnic nations and it uh, it is, if you like, uh, they're they 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 joining their integration into whatever territory they're trying to extricate themselves from was not a, a, a contraption of the international community. Some of them joined those territories on the understanding that they were entitled to, uh, to, uh, to retract if they needed to. Some had trial periods over which uh, uh, they could decide whether to stay in the union or not. So the circumstances vary from one territory to, an, to another. So it's not enough just to cite, throw out examples and say it happened here, therefore it can happen for us. No. What makes us difficult, as I've been uh, struggling uh, to say all through this program, is that we are a colonial contraption. And it is the colonialist who brought us together. It is the colonialist who uh, who marked each step of the way. Paradoxically, paradoxically, if there is any decision with respect to the 
the composition of a, a country called Cameroon. Paradoxically, if there is one decision which was taken by Cameroonians as opposed to colonialists elsewhere, it is the decision, the, the choice of our people on the 11th of February to achieve independence by joining the Republic. Everything else was thrown on us by colonialists. Dr. And Munzu, therefore, you were, you were, you were and, very and therefore, active. excuse me, yes. excuse me. So, so what I'm saying there is that uh, be, be, with that as a background, a negotiated independence is not uh, it's, it's, it's not realistic at this time. Negotiating independence with who? And, that, and that's why as early as July 2017, when this thing started at a conference in Atlanta, I said to the audience, which included the likes of my friend, uh, Professor Carlson Anyangwe, uh, the likes of Barista Bob Harmony Bobga, uh, who, as you know, <laughs> are quote unquote separatists, that let's not fool ourselves. We're not going to get independence by diplomacy. So if we insist that it has to be independence, we should know that it can only come by war. OK? And since uh, what has a, a, a moral choice between independence by war and returning to the 1961 arrangements, by negotiation. That, those are two options. And Dr. Munzu, you, 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 you cited uh, another legal limina, uh, luminary, uh, Dr. Carlson Enyangwe. What divides both of you? You are very knowledgeable. I mean, you are legal scholars. If I'm not mistaken, what divides your position from his position? Who is wrong and who is right? No, I don't think at the end of the day, my dear uh, brother Divine, it's a matter of who's wrong, who's right. At the end of the day, it's a matter of... Uh, uh, you can take you can take positions, some of which are just ideological. You can take positions that are sentimental. You can take positions. So I don't work on the basis of I am right, he is wrong. I don't know whether he would work on the basis that he is right, I am wrong. But I don't work on the basis that I am right and anybody is wrong. I I put forth I put forth my my arguments, and if you say if you if you plead, uh, General Assembly resolution. 1541, I try to show you why I think it's not applicable. If you plead uh, uh, UN Charter uh, Article 100 and, uh, 104, which I've heard them spit around, I, I, tell, I tell you why I think it is not feasible. And I expect you in rejoinder to tell me why you think it is. If we can go like that. But it doesn't have to, it, it breaks down only where instead of doing that, you throw argument out the window and you concentrate on abusing and insulting someone. That doesn't help us in any way. Dr. So, Munzo, uh, you, so, you, so, so, so you my, my, just, just to, just, so just to, to okay, on the one you just, uh, the, I, 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 I can only say that, I can only say that uh, 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 Prof. Anyangwe, so Carlson, uh, uh, given that we, we started, we started at the same position at, at, at some point, uh, has obviously, obviously, obviously at some point, uh, came to accept that uh, the attitude of Yawunde was not helping, was not leaving people any choice, and that therefore uh, we had indeed come to uh, what we what we call at some point the zero option. So he's entitled in terms of the evaluation, the assessment of us having arrived at that point, he's entitled to his opinion, and I'm entitled to mine. I'm going to ask you one question, and then I'm going to open the lines for people to open uh, to call 240-603-7367. 240-603-7367. Everyone, take note. I'm going to ask one question and then open the line. But before I do that, please take note. This broadcast is aired on our brand new website, www.chatnightafrica.net www.chatnightafrica.net. It's also being aired now live on YouTube for those who are not on Facebook. The question I have, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Um, Dr. Monzo, before I open the phone line to the public is, you took part in the all Anglophone conference, ASC1 and ASC2. Am I correct? Correct, of course. I not only took part, I, I, I co-convened. Very good. Yes.
Dr. Anyangwe took part. Am I right? Of course. He, he, we, as I said, we co-convened. Now, yeah. what, what was it in one line? What was it meant to accomplish, sir? What? The all Anglophone conferences. Oh, it, f first, it was meant to, uh, to awaken coll collective consciousness of uh, Southern Cameroonians about our plight in, in, the, in the union with, with the Republic of Cameroon. So especially, don't forget, again, I like to put things in, in, in context. Don't forget that the, we, we, con we convened the, the All Anglophone Conference the first time in Boya in the context of an ongoing constitutional reform exercise, which had been initiated by, uh, by, the, by, by President Bia. Okay? And we said we must seize the opportunity of this constitutional reform process to put the Anglophone problem on the table. Were your ideas incorporated in the new constitution? No, they were not, because I mean, we were, our, our proposal was a federalist proposal. We submitted a draft federal constitution. Uh, the Southern Cameroon National Council did that, and uh, which was uh, rejected outright by, uh, by, first by uh, the, the chairperson of our, of our commission or committee, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Professor Joseph Owona, and, and subsequently by the, by the entire constitutional reform uh, process, which is the reason why once they refused to accept uh, our draft federal constitution, the three of us, uh, Barrister Kontan Elad, uh, doctor then, he's a professor now, but he was Dr. Uh, uh, Carlson Anyangwe at the time, and, and myself, we decided to boycott uh, the rest of the of of, of the of, of the, the, the drama that was going on at the time. The reason I ask you these two last two questions, sir, mm -hmm. and follow up, is you understand? Do you understand why people? Some people are angry with you. Some even call you a traitor. I mean, if you had worked them up to understand that they are being marginalized, and then they say, "Okay, we are complaining, and nobody is listening to us. We're going to have to finish this in the battlefield." Why would you back down from supporting them in a battle? No, I mean, when, in, when in, you in, have sensitized them to the point that well, they feel so angry, so angry. Yeah, okay. I mean, in, in terms of uh, being angry with me and calling me names and all of that, uh, which is, I mean, they, they, they're entitled to do that, but that doesn't change the fundamentals as far as I'm concerned. Uh, leadership, leadership also, uh, uh, dear divine, le le leadership also means having the courage to tell those whom you are leading that if you go the way they're trying to push you, you'll be going down a blind alley. You understand? So uh, I have had my experiences, including, as I said at some point, uh, my awareness of the devastation of war, okay, and the consequences of war. Uh, war, war is not a game. And you've got, if, as a leader, you've got to weigh uh, the, the, the consequences of the war option with the possibility that you don't even win the independence by war at the, at the end of the day, because uh, there, are, there are many, many, many examples where people have been fighting their war of independence for, for 40 years and they, have, they haven't got there. So I am entitled as a leader uh, to weigh uh, the consequences of uh, a war of independence that could be protracted on the same population that I say I want to serve and opening the possibility with an international community that, that is more aware now about our problem than they were in 1993, 1994, opening that possibility of making a case for something that is defensible, namely that we say we were, uh, there was a breach of the our, our, our agreement to stay a federation. That case can be made, especially to an international community which today is more aware of the problem and more sympathetic to that possible outcome than they were in 1993, 1994. Dr. Mozu, you have to balance these things. And you don't just say, oh, well, we're going to start shooting around. If that, was the, if that was the problem or if that was the solution, then why are we complaining? We, we see how in barely, I would say barely, because there are places where this kind of thing go, drags on for 25, 30, 40 years. And we are still only in year five. But look at the amount of devastation in year five. Do you think that I would sit down 
without thinking very hard about what the consequences could be. I just say, well, uh, go ahead and, and pick up arms. I've got to think about the possible consequences of, of such an option. And you, that will I, have to I, be I, a I last would, option. I, I would say you're talking now as a diplomat. I mean, you know, diplomats usually want negotiate, negotiated settlements and so on. You were at the United Nations for a very long time. If I am not mistaken, one of the positions you held was Deputy Secretary General. Am I right, sir? No, not, not, oh, not, not Deputy Secretary General. I, I, I rose to the rank of Assistant Secretary General. Assistant yes. Secretary General. Mm -hmm. Do you get to that rank without the um, proposition of your home government? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I should have. I should you have you know where I'm getting. I, I'm, I, should I'm, have, I'm I, should have, I should have known that that question would come, but indeed, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up <laughs> because. So uh, for, for okay, the, for the, I want, for I want hundreds, to ask this for many people to, to get your answer the, on record. Exactly. For the Do you become time. Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations mm -hmm. without so, the support of your home government? Absolutely. For the hundredth time, let me answer. Absolutely, you can. And uh, we may be few uh, uh, Southern Cameroonians, Anglophone Cameroonians, and perhaps even we may be few Cameroonians, uh, in, in short, uh, to have risen to that rank in the system, but I'm not the only one. Okay, I'm not the only one, and I would I would ask you pick up your phone after this um, program and call, for example, uh, Mr. Sami Kumbo, whom you probably who, whom you should know. Now, Sami, Sami <laughs> retired not so long ago from the from UN service where he, he also at the rank of Assistant Secretary General in the Department of Political Affairs, as, as he was called then. Now call, call him, call, call, call Sami and ask him whether it was the Cameroon government that proposed him for that position. Do you know uh, why I asked call, that call, question, I, sir? I read, I read recently, by the way, I read in one of the millions of write-ups that the issue there to denigrate Simon Munzo because uh, one of the arms, the most effective arms that separatists have invented for this quote-unquote war of independence is to uh, to denigrate uh, Simon Munzu as if that would um, win the war for them. But one of the writers that I saw recently was, oh, you know, Simon Munzu was uh, a, a, a representative of the United Nations in, they even said Namibia, uh, Zimbabwe, <laughs> Zimbabwe, of the United Nations Development Program. He represented UNDP in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, you cannot get to a position like that uh, without the approval of your government. For heaven's sake, we have many Cameroonians who are, representing United Nations Development Program or other agencies of the UN uh, around the world, I would give you names. Call, call Mr. Sam Dominic, who is in, 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 in Congo today, is in uh, Kinshasa, as the uh, country director of the, of the UNDP. In, uh, in, 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 call him and find, find out from him whether it was, his, it was Cameroon government that, that, that put him in that position. So the point I'm asking, is sir, is, what I want is, to say is you this. owe no allegiance. You owe no allegiance whatsoever to Mr. Bia or Ijo. Absolutely none. And and I have said it over and over again, steering not only the Cameroonian people, but President Bia and everybody else in the regime in the eye to say, let anyone come forward and say that Simon Munzu, from the moment that I, I resigned, my teaching position in the University of Yaounde because of the Anglophone problem and my very active involvement in the SCNC at the time, from the ranks of the CPDM. Now, let anyone come forward and say that between the, uh, that uh, September of 1994, I think, four or five, I think it was, that I tendered a resignation, a letter of resignation, and that, 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 that letter of resignation, I, which I tendered at the time, is, is in the, I saw a copy of it in Cameroon Post recently, Cameroon Post. Now let anybody from the government, from the opposition, from uh, the separatists, from anywhere, anybody come forward and say, Simon Munzu, this is what you ever received from the Bia regime. I don't ask them anything. Not because, not because I could not. I can tell you that I have, I have friends in the regime. I have people in there. So if what I wanted was to go and get my own share of the cake, that wouldn't be so difficult. I didn't commit anything that they would say, oh, you cannot come back to us. I was now, in the CPDM before. Now the but phone line, I act, yes. I, I act on principle. I act on principle. 
and unconscious. That doesn't change uh, with the season. No. Now, on the, the other hand, on, on the other hand, on, on the other hand, I, 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 I do not believe that I need to be a radical extremist just for the purposes of looking good. No, I follow my my head and my heart. Are there times that extremism or radicalism, what you call extremism or radicalism, are there times that they are justified, sir? Well, I mean, philo philosophically, I'm sure there, there must be, philosophically. But as I say, we're not dealing with philosophy. We're not dealing with, we're not in a, in a, in a, in a, we're not in a, in a, in a, in a lecture theater. This is not, this is not academics, my, my dear brother. I wonder academics. what circumstances, Dr. Munzo, can a people exercise the right, their right to self-determination? Oh, well, I mean, first, first of all, there's no there's no universal rule for that. Again, I hear uh, people uh, th throwing about the General, General Assembly Resolution uh, uh, 1514, 1541. You can easily mistake it with 1541. There's 1514. 1514 on the declaration of uh, the, the grant of independence to colonized people and all of that. Now, trying to give the impression that there is some kind of universal, permanent uh, uh, right to self-determination. And it's enough for you, a group of people, to say we are a people. We, we, want, we, want, we want our self-determination to get independence. No, it doesn't work like that. If it works like that, <laughs> there will be 3,000 independent countries in the world. Not, well, if, not, if, not, not the 173 that we have today. Dr. Munzo, apparently the United so, Nations doesn't care. You say they cannot go back to what... what you know what existed, what the decisions or they, they, they oversaw. Why should separatists, those fighting for independence in Cameroon, care about international community that doesn't care about them or the plight or the war in the first place? Why should no, they I mean, not care? No, I why, mean, should, you know, why should they care? Well, I'm, I'm not asking them to care. <laughs> I'm not asking them to care because, by by definition, when you when you take up when you decide to take up arms, you are in effect saying that. You don't you don't care about anything. So uh, I'm not asking them to care. It is it is their choice. They've made it, and I will not uh, try to uh, persuade them to do anything otherwise. But let me just um... as as you're doing, looking at the document you want to yes, read, read and, 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 and and you say that all the things you ref reference, the documents are there for anybody to read. Correct? Oh, Do you sure. that? Of course, I mean I'm giving you the I'm giving you their title so anybody can go can can Google the documents in question. Okay, regrettably, I would have loved for the uh, Secretariat of Communications for Ambazonia to be here. I sent them repeated invita invitations and uh, I got no word back. I thought somebody should be there from from that angle, from that perspective, to confront you live on the stage. But that notwithstanding, my um, phone lines are open. If you're overseas, yeah. you can do zero. One zero zero one two four zero six zero three seven three six seven. If you oh, that's an, that's a WhatsApp call again, let me repeat uh, zero zero one two four zero six zero three seven three six seven. If you are in the United States or Canada, you simply pick up your phone and call two four zero six zero three seven three six seven. Dr. Munzo, why has the United Nations remained sort of indifferent? Uh, and, well, and okay, that that comes on cue because I was going to read you. Okay, you know, I said people keep uh, citing the, the right to self determination is granted by United Nations uh, resolution one one five one four. Let me just read you, and your your listeners can can go afterwards and, and cross check. All right, sir. This, this is what this is what uh, paragraph six out of the, a short a short uh, declaration of seven paragraphs. This is what paragraph six says. Any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and the territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Do I need to read that again? Yes, sir. Any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and the territorial integrity 
of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, this is this it's now so uh, people can say, well, we don't give a damn. Our territory is subjugated and we're going to free it, we're going to liberate it. You UN or no UN. That's fine. They make their commitment, and uh, if they can do it, good luck. But but do not do not expect. Do not expect in the face of this kind of principle enunciated by the United Nations, do not expect and therefore do not be surprised if the United Nations says, no, we, we cannot be with you there because what you're doing is effectively uh, disrupting the national unity and the territorial integrity of a country. Well, but he, he, here's what you appear as legal... Um... Uh, scholars like Anyangwe, they have argued, they have said that interna territorial integrity is guaranteed by international treaties. And they say former West Cameroon had defined territories in an international treaty. Why is he wrong? No, they're not wrong. If, 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 they, if they limit it at that, they're not wrong, uh, Divine, they're not wrong. There is no, absolutely no doubt that the boundaries, the boundaries between uh, British administered Southern Cameroons, the trust territory, if you like, of Southern Cameroons administered by the United Kingdom and the, and the, and, and, and the uh, 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 trust territory of French Cameroon administered by France were clear and they are still clear. You understand? So if we're talking in terms of the colonial boundaries, they exist. However, starting from the 1st of October 1961, by virtue of our two territories having united to form the Federal Republic of Cameroon, there is no international boundary between us anymore. We have an international boundary with Nigeria. We have an international boundary. In our case, in fact, we have an international boundary only with, with Nigeria. La Republic has an international boundary with all these other countries that surround it. But by virtue of the two territories having come together in 1961 to form one, there is no internal boundary. Now, in the event, in the event, hypothetical, the hypothetical event of um, Southern Cameroons winning this war of independence and having to negotiate, because you know even a, a war ends up with, with negotiation at the table, one of the things that they would have to discuss at the table would be to say, let's now uh, reintroduce Let's, we have to reintroduce the boundary because we're not, one, we're not going to be one country anymore from this moment on. So we, we reintroduce the boundary. And it will be exactly where it, it was, the one that divided the territory, assigning one side to the United Kingdom and the other side to, the, to France, is what's going to be the boundary between our two territories. But until that happens, until that happens, we don't have an internal boundary as of today with. The, the, the former uh, French Cameroon, because we form one country. And for those who say that uh, uh, Dr. Munzu isn't um, speaking the truth or stretching the facts or stretching the truth or stretching the truth, please, I have given you my number. You can dial this number <laughs> and point out, please. Don't, exactly. What are the lines? Don't wait. Don't wait. And that's why I opened, I didn't have to open the lines. That yeah. is why. I have opened the line so that you can call and point out if you think that he is um, a traitor, as some of you have called him, or you has, he has betrayed English-speaking Cameroonians or Southern Cameroonians, or you think there are facts he's twisting, please don't do this after the program is closed. The lines are open 240-603-7367. 240-603-7367. This is a question James Tato has posed. What were the terms 
coming together with um, uh, East Cameroon, and are the terms respected? I think well, probably you answered that, that question. Very, very simple. The, the terms were contained in uh, the constitution of the Federal Republic. All right. There is, there is a caller on the line. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Voices of Africa at Chat Night. Hi, uh, uh, New Divine Chamakong. This is uh, Mandanga, Mandanga, Ma Bavanga, Mandangi. Just hold on. Uh, Let me make sure that Dr. Munzu can hear you. Dr. Munzu, do you hear the caller? Yes, I do. Okay, your question, sir. Yes, um, Mr. Munzu, he cited the charter of the UN uh, talking about how the UN would, uh, would not allow countries with already known uh, territorial boundaries and sovereignties to, to, to be independent or to break away. I mean, uh, I, I wanted to ask him, when was that charter signed? Or, I mean, when was that policy put in place by the UN? Because in 2011, the circumstances had forced the United Nations to grant independence to, to South Sudan. And using that same example by, of South Sudan, uh, he said uh, South Sudan and the other countries, Eritrea, were ethnic conflicts. South Sudan is an ethnicity. It need to be an ethnicity for the UN to, 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 to grant independence. So it's not like every conflict that the US, the United Nations has, has had to intervene, has to have the elements of ethnicity. So even in today's world, it must not be a tribal en uh, entity. It must not be an ethnic entity, even uh, 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 on the basis of colonization. The colonial culture can give an Okay, somewhere your voice died off, so, but I think the essence of uh, your points have been made. Um, uh, Dr. Munzu, uh, can you respond to Mr. Mavangi? Yes, uh, of course. The, uh, I, I, think, I think we need to, to distinguish between two things. There have been instances where a, a people who have chosen that they are going to fight for their independence, as some people say, to the last man standing, the, the, the pursue that cause, the pursue that cause, and that has nothing to do with the UN authorizing or not authorizing, allowing or not allowing. Let's be clear about that. When you decide that you are going to win uh, your, or, or regain your independence by war, and you, you set out on that cause, no one is going to stop you because no one is going to, the only thing that can stop you is your, when, when you run out of ammunition, okay? So, you, you do it, and that's why some, some, some people have been at it for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, all right? And if that is what uh, the separatists have embarked on, then of course, I mean, we have, I, 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 have, I have nothing against that. That's, what, that's their option, and that's it. What we are talking about is where, while you are doing that, you expect that while you are doing that, you would expect the international community to come in, in support uh, and support you uh, to come and help you end the conflict, to come and help you negotiate your independence. No. Those examples, don't, don't you see how long it took South Sudan? Don't you see how long it took Eritrea? So I'm not saying, and let's be very clear about this. I'm not saying that if the intention is that, uh, and as I've, I've heard some people say, uh southern Cameroonians are going to fight till the last man standing of course <laughs> then <laughs> go ahead that has something to do with the un or the international community it simply means that you rely on your own resistance power it gets you on until the day comes when in 30 years time 40 years time you have uh, uh, beaten uh cameroon so flat that cameroon is forced Perhaps at that point, under the, under the pressure of the international community, to come and sit down with you and negotiate. Okay, so that's what I, the, the question. However, is that uh, do we necessarily want to get to that point, given all the possible consequences on our population, as long as there is a window of opportunity of us having a negotiated settlement, the outcome of which falls short of independence? but allows us to regain our autonomy within Cameroon. That's the debate. Nothing, nothing short of that. You are watching uh, 
Voices of Africa at chat night. We will be uh, bringing in, uh, bringing back uh, Dr. Munzo in just a moment, but time for us to uh, watch this uh, video. Uh, it's a musical interlude from the Northwest region of Cameroon. <laughs> gentlemen join me once more in welcoming dr simon munzo our guest this week on the platform dr munzo here is a question uh mr june francis has texted in from china professor wouldn't you uh, regard uh, republic of cameroon as um, republic of cameroon I, I read it the way he sent it to me as a secessionist state, given that they willfully pulled out of the Union, Re United Republic of Cameroon, and maintained the name La République de Cameroon, Cameroon, which they had before the referendum? Oh, well, you know, again, um, I've, I've had that argument uh, before. And uh, when you say that people should dispassionately look at what happened in order to understand it better and therefore even prepare ourselves our own case better uh, they quickly dismiss you as as uh, a traitor and all of that because th th this is what happened uh, 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 mr chamukong as we said uh, as we said earlier the federal republic of cameroon was made up of of, of British Southern Cameroons and the former Republic of Cameroon, okay? And when the name of the country was changed in 1972 to United Republic of Cameroon, it was still those two territories, all right? Now, the, the United Republic of Cameroon was a successor state, a successor, a successor state not to Republic of Cameroon, the, the former French Cameroons, and this is uh, the, the, your, your listeners, or those who are not prejudiced, should listen to this very carefully. The United Republic of Cameroon was a successor state, not to Rep the former Republic of Cameroon, which had become the federated state of East Cameroon. It was a successor state to the Federal Republic of Cameroon, made up of Northwest and Southwest. Sorry, middle of West Cameroon and East Cameroon. Okay. Now, come 1984, Mr. Bia decides to change the name of the country on the pretext that we have gone beyond unity, which he said the name United Republic of Cameroon reflected. We're now going higher to integration. And for integration, he decided that the name of the country should revert to Republic of Cameroon. 
Now, this Republic of Cameroon that we're talking about, starting from 1984, is not a successor state to the Republic of Cameroon that became the federated state of East Cameroon. Once again, it is a successor to the former United Republic of Cameroon, former Federal Republic of Cameroon. It is not a successor to the former Republic of Cameroon. Was the name changed constitutional? That's the follow-up. No, wait a from minute. No, it, it's important for us to understand that because, in fact, if uh, um, the, 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 the action of Ahijo in 1972 was tantamount not only to the suppression of West Cameroon, West Cameroon and its government and its institutions disappeared in 1972, right? East Cameroon, with its government and its institutions, also disappeared in 1972, right? Under this new appellation. So we cannot be talking today as if we disappeared and they remained. And since then, they have been colonizing us and so on. Let me it make sure I understand not, you. It, it is are, not, are you talking it from it the point the of act. view of law it, it or giving your the opinion? Act, it is not the act of Republic of Cameroon in the sense of the territory that was governed formerly by France, which became the federated state of East Cameroon. No. If, 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 if Mr. Bia wanted, instead of borrowing or stealing the name Republic of Cameroon, he should have taken something else. He could have called his thing the Integrated Republic of Cameroon. But just leaving it Republic of Cameroon is what is creating this, uh, this, this impression. And therefore, I, for, for a start, I don't, I don't uh, in my analysis, I don't accept that what is happening to us now is being done to us by Republic of Cameroon in the sense of the former federated state of East Cameroon. What is happening to us is happening through the person who inherited the United Republic of Cameroon, which inherited the Federal Republic of Cameroon, which, which comprised both East Cameroon and West Cameroon. This is what uh, Mr. Mavanga says. Uh, Mr. Munzu is wrong. In 1984, Mr. Bia simply changed the name to what it was in 1961. Well, in other I'm, words, I'm, I'm explaining. I'm explaining. He, he doesn't seem to. He doesn't, Mr. He doesn't seem to want to understand what I'm saying. I'm sure he's intelligent enough to hear me and to. But he doesn't want to accept it. That's okay. That's his right. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't convince him, and it's not my. I'm not. Set, I'm not setting out to convince anybody. I'm setting out to understand, to set, uh, to state the situation as I understand it. Once again, how can anybody say that he picks the name, Mr. Bia picks the name that the territory that was formerly colonized by France got at the time of their independence on the first of January 1960. That's the name they gave themselves. But that name and the sovereignty of that territory disappeared once and for all on the 1st of October, 1961, when that territory under that name decided to simply become the federated state of East Cameroon in a new country called the Federal Republic of Cameroon. But and, I, and, and, I, and I add, that in 1972, Ahijo did not revive. Ahijo did not revive East Cameroon. For you to say that while we were we, we maintained in our, we remained in our in our state of disappearance as a sovereign state in 1961, their own was revived. Ahijo didn't do that. Ahijo simply said that the, the the Federal Republic, which emerged from this union of these two, becomes henceforth the United Republic. Now, when Bia comes, Bia does not revive the former Re Re Republic either in terms of its sovereignty and so on. He didn't, he didn't go to declare the reinstatement, the restoration of their independence, and then annex us. No. 
He left things as he inherited them from Ahijo, these two territories together, and then decided in renaming the territory to use the, the name of one of the two, which was, which was wrong, even politically incorrect. Okay? But that does, that does not entitle us. That doesn't entitle us to, to draw the conclusion that it is La République of, 19, of January 1960, uh, 1960 to October 1961, that it is this La République which is doing what it is doing to us. No. That, that, that Republic has never been, it has not been revived. There is a call uh, coming in. Uh, this is uh, Voices of Africa. Hello. Yes, hello. Yes, you are calling from Canada. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, hello? yes we, we're hearing you. Yes, I'm Ambrose Atemkeng. I'm calling from Canada. What's your question, sir? Yes, I. I have a, a, a remark and two questions for Dr. Munzo. Go ahead. Yes, the first thing I want to say is that uh, knowledge is, somebody, is something that no one owns alone. And that an intellectual like Dr. Munzo, I don't think he should take extreme positions. I don't think saying that you cannot, an intellectual should never say cannot. Because if you say cannot, it means the world should have been the way it was right at the beginning. Things will never have changed. So that is the first observation. Now, the two questions I have for Dr. Monzo is that he said that he has been at the United Nations and uh, has been up to the rank of Assistant Secretary General. And knowing Dr. Muzo from AAC1, AAC2, and the Trapatite, what has he done in his position at the UN to make the case of Southern Cameroon in the direction in which he is thinking to avert war as he has seen war in different countries? That's my first question. Excellent question. The second question is that the United Nations Secretary General at that time of 1961, Doug Hummerford, is a Swedish, and Swedish are very honest people. He said that joining the Southern Cameroon and the Republic of Cameroon is like forcing a balloon in water which will one day explode. If a man of that caliber could make that statement, it means he foresaw, he saw a lot of things happening at that time which was not right. What is Dr. Monzo take on this? Thank you. Thank you for those excellent questions, sir. Dr. Monzo, your response. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Temkin. Uh, with respect to your, your comment, uh, the, uh, when you say, I don't, I don't claim to have a monopoly of knowledge, my dear brother. I don't. And uh, I, uh, even, even on issues that I know well, I don't claim to have a monopoly of knowledge. Uh, but on any issue, if you have an opinion and you're convinced about the soundness of your opinion, you'll be doing a disservice not only to yourself, but to those who ought to hear you if you don't state that opinion. You understand? So in, in, in all of this, all I have been doing all along is state my opinion based on my analysis of the situation. I am I'm not out to convince anybody. I don't own a political, I don't, I'm not a political party. I'm not in a movement. I'm not selling a, a viewpoint to the masses. I am contributing to the debate. And some people would agree with me and others will disagree with me. So, so what did so, you do, sir, in your, during your tenure as Assistant Secretary General? No, wait a minute, I'm coming, I'm coming to that. I'm not, okay. I'm not, yeah, I'm coming to that. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, he, 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 he made a comment and then asked the question, so I have to re react to the okay. comment as well. All right, sir. And uh, so let, let's be clear about that. And, and as for saying um, it, it will never happen, of course, I mean, if, 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 you, if, if you are sure based on your analysis of the situation that a certain outcome is not possible. I mean, why, why would you say? Why wouldn't you say that it's not possible? 
you should say so. As long as you have what there is to back it up. Uh, otherwise, you just go around. You cannot, you, you cannot, on a particular issue, have as many outcomes as there are people talking. No. If you are convinced about the outcome that you see, state it. People may agree or not agree with you, but you're not going to say that because there is a likelihood that they don't agree with you, you don't state it. You'll be doing a disservice not only to, to, to yourself, but to them as well. Now, uh, with respect to what have I done, um, Mr. Temkeng, uh, something that people may not know is that you have to distinguish between, for those who work in the United Nations, you have to distinguish between the, the staff of the United Nations who are employees of the United Nations, they, they constitute the International Civil Service. You have to distinguish between that and the member states. Distinguish between, between that and member states. So you can you can you can, you can rise to the rank that you that you want at the UN. If it is as an employee, you are just an employee. You are an employee. Including incidentally the Secretary General, he, he in his capacity as the Chief Administrative Officer of the UN, one of his official titles, he is an international civil servant. Okay, and therefore anyone who, uh, as an international civil servant, would uh, fool you that he could, from his position, uh, undertake matters like this and uh, bring the UN to act will be fooling you and i have no intention to fool you i i, I was i, I was I, I was a, a civil servant in, in the un and I, I rose to the rather i rose as a civil servant in the un Take not the as a question not, uh, not uh, as a you... political actor okay now that that links up to your question about uh to your question or or comment about uh dark hammer shot yeah what, once again uh, it, it comes to what I was saying. Even the Secretary General of the UN is uh, the the first amongst the civil servants, the people who service the UN. He is not, in that sense, a political actor, in the sense of decisions of the UN Security Council, decisions of the UN General Assembly. Now, those are the decision-making bodies in the UN. They, 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 can, they can receive reports from the Secretary General, charge him to go and study a particular issue, take initiative to carry to implement their decisions and all of that, but he does not decide in their place. And therefore, it is not impossible that on his own, or from his own perspective, Secretary General, General Dakhama showed could indeed have seen things the way that you are saying he saw them. But the politicians, quote unquote, in the Security Council, which are member states, in the UN General Assembly, who are member states and who are the ones who play the political game, they don't play, they don't, they don't play it according to what the Secretary General wants them to do. They instruct the Secretary General. The Secretary General does not instruct them. And that and that that is true of all Secretary General. Wouldn't it be better for United Nations to intervene now than wait when it's too late, sir? What just in? If, I know you can go on and on with this for for, for a while, mm -hmm. but please give me a short answer to this. What determines the United Nations' involvement in country A and not country B when both countries are mired in armed conflict, intrastate armed conflict? Why isn't the United Nations not coming in now? There are, there are a number of things that come into play. Uh, the first, if you like, and you, you, you may not like to hear this, I probably don't like to say it, but that is it. The first is the uh, interests of the member states, especially uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council. They're not going to go into a situation, an, an armed conflict situation, just for the sake of it, or just for the for 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 the for for, for the, 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 uh, the the way they feel about the citizens of that country. Again, when I talk about illusion, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, none of this is done 
automatically in the interest of the people of the territory. The, the fundamental for them is their own national interest. If they find that what is going on is something that is likely to affect their strategic, economic, uh, military, security interest in a particular manner, they would dive in without waiting, without, without blinking an eye. If on the other hand, they feel that there is no interest, uh, unfortunately, they will play, turn a blind eye to the, the human suffering and all of that, number one. Number two, and within that framework, there is a tendency to uh, say that when something is happening, uh, the first port of call is the regional organization, increasingly, the regional organization. So it's happening in Africa, they say, well, it has to be African Union first. And the UN will support the African Union. Now, in turn, uh, and this is debilitating for many of us, in turn, the, the African Union will say that if it is in the West African sub-region, it should be ECOWAS taking the lead. If it is in the South, 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 South Africa sub-region, it should be uh, SADC taking the lead and so on. Now, it happens to be that in our own situation, the country that is the locomotive of our sub-region, the Central African sub-region, is, is Cameroon. And uh, where it is Cameroon, that needs to be brought to book. If the African Union continues to insist that it should start with the sub-regional organization taking the lead, then you see, you see already where we are. Now, these are the intricacies of the situation. It doesn't have to do with pleasing us or not pleasing us. This is the way the world works. And what we've been saying is, we have, we have in our planning, in our strategy, and all of that, to integrate all these things into it. Otherwise, we are, um, you know, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, fool, fooling ourselves. I got that. Now, let me ask you, let, let me, may I, may I, I don't know, I don't know there, are, there are two questions, in <laughs> fact, which, 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 I, which I read on the chat. Am I, yes. am I allowed to come to those ones? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead. So, go, but I, there are two here that I would like to address, but go ahead. Okay, let's talk about if you had, if you had an Ambazonia, they call it. They, they would like to like it to be a federation of the northwest and southwest region. That's what they call Ambazonia. The question is, when you, I've heard from many people from the southwest region that that's going to happen over their dead body. Do you see that even working? Part one. That's part A of my question. Number two. That's even if we were to have independence. Do you see a peaceful coexistence between the Northwest and the Southwest region? But B of my question, if we even went back to the federal status, two-state federation, would that work? Do you see that possibility working? Well, again, you know... Um... And I, I asked this question because from the start, I said my questions were going to reflect a broad... No, absolutely. No, 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 that's fine. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the question. That's fine. Most welcome. Because, I mean, again, for me, no subject is taboo. We're carrying out an analysis of the situation, not to please people, but to, uh, to hopefully arrive at a greater understanding of the situation within all its complexities. In all its complexities, there's no simplistic solution here. So, the Northwest Southwest dichotomy, divide, call it what you will. I mean, there is a historical uh, foundation uh, to uh, what some people will see as uh, this distrust between the two. Once again, not in terms of the interaction at a human level. I'm not aware in all my 72 years, I'm not aware that there is animosity between Northwest let me say, in fact, between Northwesterners, as we call them now, and Southwesterners. I'm not aware of that at a human level. But we cannot escape the, from the fact that the functioning of the state of Southern Cameroons, subsequently West Cameroon, in the period when it had self-government, meaning from 1954, when Ndeli formed the first government, to 1961, so a period of 
seven years. When we talk about it in glorious terms, you will think it would have been 70 years. But in that seven year period, uh, uh, 54 to uh, 61, yeah, a, a number of things happened in terms of the way the place was run uh, under the uh, leadership of a succession of Northwest prime ministers after the short thing with, 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 with Endeley, that uh, people had, have, have, have had reason to complain about the way things were conducted at the time. And uh, also that includes subsequently the period from 1961 to 1972 before the abolition of the state of West Cameroon. So, yeah, if you talk to people, especially those who are involved in the civil service, the functioning of state institutions uh, and all of that, they have a, st a set of grievances. And so you find some South, uh, Southwesterners who will say, ah, ah, we don't want that anymore. We cannot go into that anymore. All right? We, 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 we pack that to one side. But this just illustrates the reality that our situation is a complex one. And that it is not a matter of just pulling a solution out of the uh, out of the bag. You've got to adapt the solution to your analysis of the situation. Therefore, today, if we were to uh, if the, the federation were to be restored, of course the debate has is, is been on official or unofficial, asking whether it should be a two-state federation or a ten-state federation, and so on. The jury is still out on that. And I wouldn't want uh, to pontificate and recommend one or the other. But I would say taken. that... Please move on to the questions, the two questions, because at some point we're going to have to wrap up. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, but just to wrap up, <laughs> talk about wrapping up on this one very quickly. Okay, sir. I would say that, of course, the, the options are, are, are open. We need to engage a debate, a discussion about, about that amongst us Anglophones in order to come, 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 come down to a rational... Uh, choice among the various options uh, which eventually will be on the table. And, and that, by the way, was one of the reasons why we had uh, been hoping uh, that there will be a meeting of Anglophones, the Anglophone General Conference. Uh, the purpose was ab absolutely to examine issues like this amongst Anglophones before we engage with, uh, with anybody else eventually. Okay, anyway, now address the two questions, sir, and then yeah, we Now, the up. two questions. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Mr. James uh, Tato, maybe James Tato. Yeah, he said, uh, "What were the terms of coming of our coming together?" No, I mean, Mr. Tato, the terms of our coming together, following all those negotiations that I I, I mentioned step by step, especially after the twenty first of April, nineteen sixty one, were captured in what became the constitution of the Federal Republic of Cameroon that entered, came into force on the 1st of October 1961. Okay? That was the document that contained the terms of our coming together. Now, I have heard part of the propaganda and misinformation saying, oh, Ahijo signed the constitution into law uh, before the 1st of October, uh, dated 1st of September 1961. <laughs> yeah, he did. It's true, he did. But you know what? Our own government in Boya was supposed to do the same before 1st of October 1961. And they had the opportunity to do it. Because the idea was that 1st of October 1961, the new country called the Federal Republic of Cameroon will come into being with a constitution, which was to come into force on that same day. So it wasn't on that day that the parties were going to come and start negotiating. No, they agreed on the, the, the federal constitution. It was now for the parliament, the government and parliament of either of the two states to examine, endorse, and enact that into, into law. And on the 1st of October, what had been concurrently or simultaneously enacted would come into force for the for the entire country. Okay, move on now, to the second now, question. Now, yeah. now, now, wait a minute. This is okay. important, uh, Divine. The, for the, in, in La Republique, as we call we call them, La Republique did that, and uh, he, the, the parliament uh, he just signed. The parliament ratified, 
as the carrying that date of first of first of September 1961. On our side, the the Southern Cameroon's House of Assembly in Boya met on the 14th of September on a motion uh, tabled by uh, Prime Minister Foncha, uh, seconded uh, by uh, Mr. S.T. Muna, and for the oppo from the, from the from the government and from the opposition. Uh, uh, Peter uh, uh, Motombi Weneta of the of the of the of the CPNC. Now, and in fact, if you if you if you list if you see the, the wording, the, the the wording of that motion, you will weep for Southern Cameroons. This is this is the wording of the motion that Mr. Foncha tabled. The future of the Federal Republic of Cameroon approved the action of the leaders of the Southern Cameroons in the negotiations with the government of the Republic of Cameroon concerning the form of the future federation and thank the president <laughs> and government of the Republic of Cameroon for the cooperative and brotherly manner in which they have conducted negotiations. This is, what, this, 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 this is the motion. What? This is the motion that was put by Mr. Foncha in the a session of the Assembly of the West Cameroon, which was which was convened to examine the federal the, the proposed federal constitution. And when they adjourned, they adjourned. They met again on the four, on the eighteenth, four days later, eighteenth of September, for the same purpose. And at the end. It is uh, uh, this time uh, uh, S.T. Muna who proposed the motion for the ad for the approval of the constitution. It is in the records of, as they used to call it, Hansard, our our own House of Assembly. It's not it's not a fabrication. So the the the, the our own people have so many failings. I don't have time to go into the, into that now. No, we don't. Yeah, but, we, because but, we have to wrap and, up. Go and, read, go and read the archives. You will see. That what is being said again, it's a misrepresentation of the facts. And please address question two and we wrap up. Yeah, question two was from James Carter. Uh, yeah, uh, question two, I've dealt with, with question okay. two came from uh, someone whose name began with Sir or something. S I R S I I R. Okay, as briefly as possible, sir. Yeah, the union treaty. Uh, it's a, uh, was there was there a union treaty? Again, that question has been has come up over and over again. Uh, from uh, propaganda circles of uh, certain people. Now, so this to be clarified. If you say, was there a union treaty? There didn't have to be a union treaty. The parties were acting on the marching orders given them by United Nations General Assembly Resolution 1608, 1608. And 1608 simply said, you guys go initiate discussions, finalize your arrangements, make sure that you finalize those arrangements not later than the 1st of October, because on that day, the treaty, uh, the uh, trusteeship agreement between the UN and the United Kingdom will end. So the parties went engaged in discussions and ended with the constitution of the Federal Republic of Cameroon that came into force on that 1st of October 1961. That is the Union Treaty. No one has said that they should go and bring anything else. No one. But I've heard all sorts of things read into that 1608, which are not in it. And let me just finalize on that, final point on that. Yes, please. To say that even if, because it's true that uh, Article 104 of the Charter of the United Nations creates an obligation for member states of the UN to register their treaties and other international agreements with the Secretary General of the UN. Register. And an obligation for the Secretary General of the UN who receives notification of such a, a treaty or agreement to publish it, okay? That's it. But then in uh, paragraph two, 
the charter says what happens if the parties don't fail, fail to do that. The charter says that the consequence of, of non-notification and non-publication by the Secretary General is that the parties to such a treaty or agreement cannot evoke it before any organ of the United Nations. So in terms of penalty, that's the only penalty. It is not that the agreement is not binding between them. It is that in the event of dispute over that treaty, over that agreement, they should not come before any organ of the United Nations. And today, as far as I know, neither, uh, quote unquote, Republic du Cameroon, nor Southern Cameroons is before any organ of the United Nations trying to push for the recognition of any treaty or agreement between those two parties. Uh, the last question I'm going to ask you, and that will serve as your last word. So, I mean, we, we could go on and on on this till tomorrow morning. <laughs> you recognize, I apologize to the audience, we have to end the broadcast, perhaps bring you back at another time. Dr. Munzo, would you say your position many see as controversial hurts or helps the struggle? That that would be your last word. This answer would well, be your last. I mean, word. I don't. I don't. First of all, I don't. I don't know if in the in the Cameroon of today, <laughs> the Cameroon of today, and in, especially the, uh, the the southern Cameroons of today, tell me which position is not controversial. Tell me, because everybody is talking. Everybody is talking at everybody else. Everybody is shouting at everybody else. Everybody. Is, so, whose position is not controversial? Whose? This is precisely why. To avoid us being in this position, we pushed for the convening of a meeting of Anglophones. Whether to take place inside or outside Cameroon, there is a need for a meeting of Anglophones. And that is why every time I'm invited uh, to any forum, I go to talk, including appearing on the, the, the Southern Cameroon's International Town Hall, including appearing as a guest of Chris Anu on, on ABC, including uh, 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 attending uh, the, the meeting called by the by the Center for for Dialogue and Negotiations, including the, the meeting that uh, the, uh, the the separatists held in 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 in, in twenty in twenty. I, I go everywhere, not because I think that my views will be accepted by everybody, but I believe that we need uh, to to hear each other, to talk, pick what you can, pick what you don't, but to say that my views are controversial. Is that hurtful or for the for the struggle? Doesn't make any sense. Everybody's views are controversial <laughs> because we don't have any view on which Southern Cameroonians are agreed today. We don't. Would would you say what would you say the majority? Because I hear this word majority, minority of Anglophone Southern Cameroonians, they want this or don't want this. What would you say, Dr. Munzo, the majority of Southern Cameroonians today want? Let me tell you. If you were to uh, offer independence to Southern Cameroons today, they will grab it. And I will be amongst them, uh, uh, Divine. Oh, yes. Because like I said from the beginning, we were cheated by not being allowed to get the option of independence. OK? And, and that's what, some, some polls. I've seen some polls where the, one of the questions is, uh, do you want independence? Of course. If you ask a Southern Cameroonian man, woman, child, wake them up from sleep and said, oh, this is independence. Do you want to take it? They will say, yes, of course. Every one of us. Even those who are running the government in Yaoundé. OK? But, and this is why I talk of illusion. Let's not fool people to make it as if it is going to be uh, such an option. It's going to come easily. For the simple reason that while we, are, while we want to back out of the union, there are people with whom we entered into the union who are going to say, you have, you, you, you have to stay. Let's negotiate. Let's talk. OK, so, um, so, 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 so that's it. But how we, how we, that's why we must be realistic. You think that, uh, on what basis do you think that, uh, uh, quote unquote, La Republic, as we call, we call, tending to call them, we just say, you guys pack up your bags and go. It won't happen like that. Therefore, if we insist on independence, and that's what I keep saying, it can only be by war. And people say, oh, you thought, you said it would only be, but now that we said our war, you see, 
uh, yeah, you can start a war. <laughs> you have not won it yet. You've not won it yet. Okay. Uh, Biafra, <laughs> Biafra started, and for for a time they thought they were winning. Uh, they were uh, there. Are, well, there are there are examples of uh, territories that have fought and won their war of independence. We can also cite you twenty around the world today where people have been at, at war a war of independence for the past 20 25 40 years and then I, those will say ah yeah we don't we don't care if it's 40 years fine okay that's your position but don't expect me because that is your position to make that my position so people will listen to you people will listen to me and they will put their, put their heads down and say do we want is this the price we want to pay for for a war of independence or can we cut our losses and get the international community support to push for uh, the, the restoration of the federation because that is a feasible option which one could could sell uh, to the international community so that's where we are and uh, just to, just to conclude i am not out to convince anybody about anything and my views are part are, are, are as controversial as the views of all southern cameroonians are in our community today, unfortunately. Dr. Munzu, I'll give you one or two minutes to address those who oppose you so vehemently. What's the word you have for them? No, I, I mean, I have, I have no particular word for them. I don't. I mean, and there are many. I mean, uh, like I said, it, it is as if for certain uh, separatist circles, uh, the preferred we weapon in this uh, struggle or in this uh, war of independence is a heaping uh, attack, personal attack and threats against Simon Munzu. No. And I've heard in that, con in that register, I've heard all sorts of things said, all sorts of lies. Simon Munzu has not been to his village Mguti since, since 1999. <laughs> Simon Munzu, who has been making peace in his village of Mguti between factions fighting over chieftaincy, you know, but they just, they just pluck things out of, out of nowhere and say them. How does that help our struggle? Venom against Simon Munzu, vindictiveness against how does that help? I am 72. I probably wish to shut my mouth, but I can't because the issues that we are discussing are issues about which I know something. So I can't shut my mouth. It would be irresponsible to do so. So uh, if there are those who want to take shortcuts and who believe that those shortcuts are to be taken through uh, bashing Simon Munzu, fine. Even today, Divine, just to, just to conclude on that, even today, isn't, isn't, isn't it ridiculous that at a time when we as a national community, and I say national, both Anglophone and Francophone, are deploring and decrying what happened to this child in Boya yesterday? Someone, I think they call him Abdul Karim something comes out with a video today on that incident and the whole video is packed with calling simon munzu agobala uh, so and so uh, enablers this what has that got to do with it and this is someone who today is a great liberator but abdullah abdul karim ali served with me in the organizing committee for the Anglophone General Conference. Yes, he worked with me on that. Because the conference has not taken place, all of a sudden he has become a great liberator. And to seek attention and get himself some relevance, he goes ranting around and calling people names and all of that. What have we got to the incident of yesterday? Well, thank you, you know? uh, Dr. Munzu. It's been a long exhilarating a broadcast. I want to thank all of those people watching. Um, so many people have been watching. You can go ahead and share this uh, broadcast. It's on YouTube. It's on our website, www.chatnightafrica.net. You can watch it also on our YouTube channel called Chat Night Africa. It's on our Facebook broadcast uh, page right now. Also, it's been going live on those platforms. The, the broadcast page is called Chat Night Africa. And uh, I, before I go, Dr. Munzo, I really want to thank you again. I uh, invited those who hold opposing, vehemently opposing views uh, to you, and um, they didn't uh, give me what back. I don't know why. Uh, I made sure that the invitations got to them. I hope at some point 
they will accept to come on this platform. The only thing I can promise anybody who comes onto this platform is it's not going to be used for public relations. It's the Please questions don't. will be really, really sorted. And that's, and that's very and that's very important. That's, that's, it's, that it's approach, an independent that, platform. <laughs> that, 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 approach, that, that, that approach divine is very important because, I mean, it offers the opportunity to um, to state it as it is. It's not to please people, but to, to inform ourselves and educate ourselves. People will go down quietly. Some people will go back and, and digest. Others they shoot, shoot their arrows on the on the chat the chat page that's understandable I'm, I'm used to it but there are others who will sit and digest what they've heard and perhaps uh, and, and one other things. thing which we've done to keep this platform um neutral neutral balance is we've had to reduce refuse donations from people who want to help but on condition that yeah. we don't bring this a or b on the platform yeah, we cannot take such a that's, that's important we cannot yeah. If so you want to help us continue to develop the platform, you're welcome to do so. We appreciate it. There's so much we can do. By the way, I want to thank the producer of this broadcast. He is somewhere in Lagos, Nigeria. Ze Rogers Fool is a wonderfully, I mean, exceedingly talented a Southern Cameroonian in Nigeria. Thank you, sir, for staying up this late to produce this program. We are willing to take help from whatever sources as long as the help does not determine what we come here how we conduct ourselves on the platform. So that's 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 that, 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 on my last word. That's very important. That's a very good approach. Don't don't take don't take money from anybody who would want to influence you. And that's what we would have uh, long taken That's, it. What, that's what the cardinal the cardinal and I, cardinal Tumi and I tried to do. <laughs> so he did not accept donations. In fact, for the entire time, we we received two hundred thousand francs. And one of the people who used most of that two hundred thousand francs was a certain Abdul Karim Ali. For his transport and feeding from Bamenda coming to meetings of the, to the organizing committee in Douala. And let me just end by saying, by, by way of homage, that incidentally today is the 15th of uh, November, the 15th of October. So it is the birthday of the late Cardinal Tumi. He would have been 91 uh, today. So we by the way, yesterday was your birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, uh, two days ago. Th two days ago, sorry. Birthday. Yes. And yesterday, today is the. Today is the is Cardinal Tumi's birthday, and by the way, those who like to say that uh, he died, he passed away in the in the night of Good Friday to Holy Saturday, from the spiritual perspective, that's fine. But it turns out that uh, Good Friday was the second, uh, Holy uh, Holy Saturday was the third of of April this year, and you know what 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 else happened from the second to the third of April? It was the holding of the first all Anglophone conference. Wow, what so a coincidence. It, so, so it is as if Cardinal Tumi was saying to us, listen, guys, I did my best. I'm going on this symbolic day. But you guys continue what I'm, I'm leaving you to do. Thank you, sir. We will Thank leave you. it on that note. It's been wonderful having you on our platform, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how we wrap up this volcanic broadcast will find time to bring back uh, Dr. Munzo. And by the way, if what goes to either Mr. Herbert Bo or Abdul Karim or, uh, or Sako uh, Samuel or uh, uh, who is the other one? Um, Chris Anu, they are welcome here, but we will intensively question them on the positions that they take. I appreciate you all. My name is Sir Divine Jamakong once again. I want to thank my producer of this broadcast in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, uh, because of his effort, this broadcast is going to YouTube live, our broadcast page live, Chat Night Africa, our website live, um, uh, our website live, www.chatnightafrica.net. Uh, somebody says, Federalist, <laughs> great broadcast. Well, you had an opportunity to call and uh, challenge Dr. Munzo. You did not. I opened, that's why I opened the phone lines. I did not have to do it. Thank you for watching. That's how we go. We will see you again sometimes very soon. That has been Chat Night Africa, Voices of Africa. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. I'm coming. I'm coming. Coming to dance. To dance. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance, we're gonna get down, we're gonna get down, we're gonna party.